All right. If you can't see my screen, please let me know. We, we are good see. to go. Sweet. All right. So I've been asked today to talk about uh, intellectual property and licenses. And okay. Who am I? I'm uh, Wayne Beaton. I am the director of open source projects here at the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, I am by uh, training and experience primarily a software developer. Uh, I have uh, no formal legal training, and uh, as, you know, as such, take take my advice in that uh, in that context. Um, before we get started, again. Uh, I will likely during this talk use a lot of modal verbs, uh, verbs like may, might, can, could, ought. Uh, I probably actually won't say the word ought. Uh, if I don't actually say these words, please assume that I did. Uh, again, I am not a lawyer. I'm not a barrister or an attorney. Uh, I, anything that I say today should not be taken as legal advice. Um, if you require legal advice, you really need to talk to your lawyer. Um, it is a thing uh, in law that you can't just take um, to, to, to get legal advice, you need to actually have a relationship with, with the lawyer, direct relationship with the lawyer. So again, nothing I say today should be taken as legal advice. Uh, I, may, I may remind you of that periodically. Before we get started, uh, some terms, um, <clears throat> free open source software is what we do. Uh, very often referred to as Libra software, Libraware is another term, actually I haven't heard that one in a little while, but the idea with open source software, the freedoms are about being able to do what you, you know, being able, having some, some, uh, some freedom to work with the content, freedom to change, freedom to distribute. Um, it's not the same as free as in no cost or royalty free. Um, now it is, it is that, <clears throat> but it's more than just the cost. And we use the word free. The word free is, uh, certainly in English, um, got a, a, a large number of meanings. Um, there's also a notion of freeware. Uh, freeware is more of the free as in beer uh, kind of free. Generally, when we talk about freeware, this is more of a probably a 90s concept. If um, you know, the idea is that we get software is available for free, but you don't have access to the software, uh, or sorry, to the source code itself. So you wind up with something that doesn't cost anything but that you have limited freedom with regard to what you can do with it. <clears throat> um, if you're interested in actually looking at some of the old freeware uh, stuff that, uh, you know, that, that was out there, uh, oldergeeks.com is fascinating. Um, go there for the software, stay for the horrifying 90s table rich uh, website. Um, Big difference between uh, a FOSS and shareware is responsibility. There's at least an implied responsibility in, in free and open source software that adopters should participate. It's not a requirement per se, but more of a strategy. When one invests in using open source software, it is one's in one's selfish best interests to participate in the community and to contribute. Um, public domain can be problematic. I'm not gonna talk too much about that. Um, when a product program is placed into the public domain, the author must explicitly disclaim the copyright and other things in some way. In some jurisdictions, some rights cannot be disclaimed. Uh, again, uh, this is one of those gray areas. Uh, again, I'm not a lawyer. Um, this is something that we we wrestle with and work with it too. Uh, proprietary and commercial, I think, are well understood. Private is content that you build in for internal use. <laughs> Um, this notion of open source or the notions of open source are not as new as you might think they are. Uh, in the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s, there were similar freedoms to what we call uh, freeware today. Um, software was passed around uh, pretty liberally, pretty you know, with, without too much uh, care, too much thinking about, about what they were doing, uh, in fact. <clears throat> It was the case that back in those times, in, in those times, the software wasn't particularly interesting. Uh, hardware was pretty expensive and, and rare. 
uh, programmers were relatively cheap. Um, it was a, uh, um, it was a different time. Uh, around about 1980 or late 70s, early 80s, people started to realize that there was actually some value in this software stuff. And organizations started taking steps to make sure that they could um, own it and package it and sell it. <clears throat> Round about 1983, Richard Stallman uh, had his experience. Uh, the story is that with a, he, he had some frustration with a photocopier and wanted to uh, fix that frustration. I'll, I'll leave that as a story for, for the reader to, to, for you to look up um, if, you, if you want to. It's a fascinating story. Uh, long story short, um, you know, he uh, announced this uh, GNU project, uh, which uh, uh, intended to build an operating system that was like Unix, but free. Um, free Software Foundation established in the mid 80s. Notion of copyleft, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, was introduced. Uh, 19, early 1990s, uh, Linux uh, burst onto the scenes. And uh, 1998, the Open Source Initiative was founded. So we've actually been doing this uh, in some form or another for a while. Um, and again, I'll talk a little bit about some of these things. Um, the Free Software Foundation created uh, this notion of the four freedoms. This is uh, Richard Stallman and, and others. Uh, in 1986, the, the definition uh, started with only two points. It was a freedom to copy and distribute a program and the freedom to change a program. Uh, in 1996, uh, the notion was extended to uh, make an explicit mention of the freedom to study the software. Uh, finally, the, uh, the, the final freedom was, was added uh, that you know, users should be able to run the program. Uh, the existing uh, we, we like to think that as uh, programming uh, nerd types, um, starting at zero is, uh, is you know, how, how we should be counting, and that's awesome. But this is uh, sort of along the same lines as uh, thermo, the laws of thermodynamics. They just decided that there's a, you know, this new law came, into, uh, came, came to everyone's attention, and they decided it needed to be first. And since they'd already been running with one and two, they made it zero. Um, more recently, it's, or well, not all that recently, but it was then kind of, we're of the opinion now that all these freedoms are basically of equal importance. So the numbering isn't interesting, but uh, we've kept it anyway. Uh, the open source initiative, like I said, came into, into existence in 1998. Um, it's a, an advocate for the benefits of open source. They have a vision, um, and of course I'm cribbing from their vision statement. Uh, of building a world where freedoms and opportunities of open source can be enjoyed by all. They, they own what's known as the uh, open source definition. The uh, OSI reviews licenses to determine whether or not the licenses conform to an open source, to their open source definition. And they maintain a list of the licenses that do. Um, they have uh, channels where they discuss licenses, where new licenses can be added. Um, we talk an awful lot about licenses, or we care an awful lot about licenses being OSI approved. Um, there's an awful lot of vanity licenses out uh, out in the world, and um, there's a lot of licenses that look like they're possibly open source, except for one little tiny detail. Uh, and the open source initiative is, uh, is you know, again, it's a good source of, of you know, where to go to find out if a license is actually considered open source um, by, by them and by the community in general. Uh, they have a small number of open source projects they host, like Clearly Defined, um, which is concerned with uh, building a central repository for all things uh, open source licenses, uh, which again, interesting project. <laughs> I won't go through the entire open source definition. Uh, the um, uh, they have ten points. Where we start to see things that are uh, or where, where the, so all of the open source licenses that the OSI approves meet all of these criteria. Where we start to see licenses that again kind of look a little bit like open source but aren't actually open source. It's the number six there: discrimination against fields of endeavor. Um, you know, you see that you very often we'll see a license and it's wonderful and it talks about all of the various freedoms and, and everything that we have available to us. And then it says, but no commercial use. Um, you know, so like no commercial use, that's a field of use restriction. Um, there's other one, there's other licenses that feel like they're noble um, and whether or not they are, you, you know, that's an, an argument that I'm, I'm not prepared to, to, to have today. 
Um, but there's like a BSD variant that says no nuclear. So it shouldn't be, you know, that, that code should not be used in the context of uh, developing uh, nuclear reactors, uh, for example. Um, again, it generally looks like it's open source, except for this one little thing. And I have a couple more examples of that a little later, more just for fun uh, than for any, than any other reason. So why you're still here? Um, again, not a lawyer. Uh, I'm not a solicitor, a barrister, or an attorney. I do not play one on television. Uh, I am not related to any lawyers, it turns out. I, I don't believe I have anybody in my extended family who practices law. A couple of nurses, great people. Um, intellectual property is uh, basically a work of the mind. Uh, if any Anything that you create that is created through human intellect. Now, this can include obvious things like artwork and um, and, and writing and poetry, um, uh, books, uh, these kinds of, again, creations of, of, of human intellect, uh, also includes uh, software. Uh, does also include things like trademarks and patents and, and other things like that. And I'll talk a little bit about how trademarks and patents uh, work into all of this in a bit. But again, you know, what's important is intellectual property is basically anything that we imagine and then we you know, write down or enter into the computer. The notion of copyright is the right to copy uh, and, and control. Basically, as a copyright holder, you have the rights to produce, produce the work, prepare derivatives, and distribute copies of, of the work. Ownership of copyright uh, is, is initially invested in the author of the work or may be transferred to another party through agreements uh, or contracts. Um, the term of a copyright varies by jurisdiction and depends on several factors, including whether it has been published and if so, whether it was the date of publication. Um, the European Union, for example, uh, extends the rights of uh, of copyright uh, seven, until 70 years after the death of the author or 70 years after the death of the last surviving author in the case of, of joint author work. Um, 70 years seems to be common across jurisdictions, but again, it does vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. <laughs> so um, again, just to, just to reiterate, uh, free and open source software is protected by copyright law. Um, Copyright does not protect facts, ideas, systems, methods of operation, although it may protect the way these things are expressed. Um, again, ownership of a copyright is automatic. As soon as you write something down, you are the copyright holder. Now, probably. In the case where you are employed, to do work, um, there's this notion of, you know, or notion of works for hire. If you are paid to do work, it may well be the case when you commit your idea to your uh, to your code editor that it becomes your your employer's property. Um, and their pro your your employer may well be, or your con you know, the, the the person to who, or the, the the organization to whom you are contracted may become. The, uh, the copyright holder at the moment of creation. Again, it really depends on uh, the contract that you have. Um, I was with the, was talking with some university students uh, yesterday and uh, universities, our experience has been that students working at a university are um, under contract with the university and the work that they do while at the university is the, pro the, the property or the copyright of the university. Uh, again, that's our experience. It's not universal. Um, if you or people that you know are contributing and work from the university, it may be worth checking uh, with the, uh, the legal representation there to find out what rights they actually have as you what a right you would one would actually have as a student. Um, unfortunately, I can't answer that question uh, for you. Uh, again, our experience is uh, is that um, our experience is that um, again most people working for an organization are under contract such that the work that they do while working for that organization belong to the organization. We see exceptions to that. Um, 
certainly in some jurisdictions, work that you do in your off hours in your personal time um, does not fall under your employment contract. But again, this varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and this might be an example of something where you really need to check with your lawyer. Um, we see this in a lot of content. Um, I think this is mostly a U.S. thing, but um, I, I'm kind of shooting from the hip here. I'd have to go through and look at more examples. Very often see in, uh, in statements of copyright, all rights reserved. Uh, my understanding is that this is legally meaningless. Um, as soon as you create something, it is under copyright and automatically all rights are reserved. Um, so, again, all rights are reserved by default. They are reserved by definition. Uh, in the absence of any license to the contrary, you assume you must assume that the copyright holder is granted no rights for you to use the content. Um, our RIP team spends time digging when we find uh, content uh, that, that our project teams want to use. And there's no clear or clear indication of what the license is of that content. Um, we have to assume that there is no license. So we go digging and, you know, very often we'll wind up working with the team that developed the content to try and figure out what, what their, what their intentions are. Um, you know, again, this is one of those, uh, again, we, you retain all rights as a copyright holder and uh, you convey those rights only if you choose to. Um, expressing copyright, uh, the date, uh, we see this basic format copyright then C in a circle. Uh, the C in a circle part is um, actually there was there was a time where <clears throat> we were where people were claiming that the C in a circle, the actual symbol, wasn't as useful as the C in the parens. But as far as we're as we're aware right now, the C in the circle, both of those forms is completely acceptable. The date is the date that the content was initially created. Uh, a variation that you will see is you'll see very often two dates uh, date that the, the 1st date is the date that it was initially created. The 2nd date would be the date. The year, pardon me of the last modification. Right? So you'll see some examples at the bottom there. The 2nd example, uh, 2010 comma 2023. 1st created in 2010 last modified last year. You'll see that. What we've been doing with our projects, and this was based on some discussion uh, with our uh, our legal uh, the, the, the legal the, the lawyers that I have available to me, um, this, that the expressing just the initial year is sufficient. It's probably better to have both, but uh, just having the initial creation uh, year represented um, is sufficient. We in a copyright statement need to list the copyright owner now. Very often you will see copyright some project name. Projects are not generally legal entities, and that's a requirement. The owner needs to actually be a legal entity or refer to a legal entity. So the Eclipse Dash project is a project at the Eclipse Foundation. It is not a, uh, a legal entity. If you look at that, that particular project, you go through the copyright holders, uh, uh, copyright statements, You'll see that it is copyright the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, it's that it's copyright the Eclipse Foundation because I did most of the much of the work, and um, it uh, I work for the Eclipse Foundation under contract. So any work that I do is is copyright the Eclipse Foundation. Um, it's common practice to um, a, as others contribute to a project. The the owner is the initial copyright holder as others participate uh, it's common to put a comma and others after the name um, it's also uh, perhaps not common but I'm, we're seeing it more to have multiple copyright statements so as somebody else shows up and adds uh, their own uh, modifications to copyrighted content they just add another copyright line <laughs> so again some examples uh, the first uh, example is uh, just an organization owns the copyright. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's not an actual organization name. I tried to pick something relatively funny. Um, second one is an individual. So in this example here is something perhaps that I created, but then others modified. Um, and then the final form is something we started doing again with uh, some uh, some input from our, our legal uh, uh, sources. 
um, contributors to the Eclipse Foundation, right? So the Eclipse Foundation is a legal entity. Contributors to the Eclipse Foundation refers to the um, contributors and the committers that, that are working on that content. And um, this comes along with a statement that the, the, the identity of the contributors is, is available uh, elsewhere. Generally, um, the, the, um, the understanding is that the, 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 to figure out who the contributors are and who, therefore who the co copyright holders are, one can just look at the Git log. Uh, and then from there, have a fighting chance of figuring it out. In content, we express copyright by a copyright header. Uh, the general convention is that a copyright whole, uh, copyright header uh, appears at the top of every source file. So in this case, uh, this is using uh, pretty common. Um, uh, commenting format in, uh, in in programming languages, uh, double you know basically double copyright statements. This is an example I was talking about of something that was created um, by one person and then some other uh, somebody else representing an organization came by and, and added some more. Again, the copyright statement at the top, um, some indication of license at the bottom. I'll talk a little bit more about the rest of what this uh, looks like in a in a bit. Um, now, uh, this is just how we do it. Um, the, the decoration around it, all the stars and stuff like that just don't matter. Uh, we do this, I think, believe mostly because it draws attention to it, um, makes it look separate from the rest of the code. Um, this, we've, this is just a format that we've seen, uh, you know, we, we've been uh, using for a little while. Very often you will see copyright headers at the bottom of a file. Uh, which I guess makes them more of a copyright footer. Um, that's relatively uncommon uh, in my experience. Uh, top of the file just makes it very obvious and puts it out there. Um, there is some uh, logic to saying, you know, the, the license, we, we put a license file in our, um, in our in our root directory of our repository. Why do we put need to put this copyright and license header at the top of every single file too? Uh, the nature of the way that things work, people can just grab one file. Uh, providing this information uh, as clearly as you can is good for you because it makes it very clear that you are the owner and you have certain rights to it. Um, it also makes it really much easier for the adopters and consumers uh, because the idea is people are taking your open source software and they're incorporating it into products um, and they need to have some understanding <clears throat> of of copyright and license uh, because they may have to defend it. They may they may they want to make sure they have some you know the, the confidence that uh, that they can actually use your content um, with uh, you know relatively safely. Um, so again, this again this is just goodness for everybody. Uh, it can be a bit of a uh, it's, it feels like a bit of a chore, but it gets relatively easy after after you get used to doing it. It's a relatively easy thing to do. Um, copyrightable acts. So creating new content, we've talked about that. That is a copyrightable act. Modifying existing content is a copyrightable act, as is curating uh, content. So um, if you were, for example, to take somebody else's work, change it, uh, and change it, your changes are your intellectual property, and you are the copyright holder, again, or, or your employer. Um, this doesn't change the original copyright's ownership of their contributions. It just adds your copyright to it. Um, if you completely rework somebody else's work to the point where their contribution is no longer represented, they may, and again, this is where I'm starting to use modal uh, verbs here, they may no longer hold copyright on the reworked work. Um, bit of gray area, our, my tendency is to not remove copyright statements ever. Um, but there may be a case where, you know, again, you know, if you go and look through the git blame of a file and find out that some copyright holders work has completely been erased, you may be tempted to remove their name. And that may be a valid act, but, um, again, I don't know. Uh, that's something that maybe you might need some legal advice. Uh, ideas may still be represented, but again, as I said earlier, ideas are not themselves copyrightable. This is hard. Um. If you take somebody else's work and curate it, 
the copyright holder of the uh, you you become the uh, the copyright holder of those curations. Uh, one of the examples that I've I've, I've seen recently is uh, if, if somebody were to say draw a bunch of pictures, uh, the somebody would be the copyright holder or probably their employer. If you were to take those pictures and put them into a particular order and add captions and and do things, not modify the pictures themselves, but put them into some order and put them on a web page or or put them into a book, that act is a copyrightable act. Now, you would then, in that case, share copyright of the combined work. Your curation does not erase the copyright of the original copyright holder, but it adds to it. Um, this actually starts to become important when we start talking about generated content uh, or content generated by monkeys. Um, save that for a little discussion later. Um, I did mention that I'm not a lawyer, uh, right? Um, wholesale copying of somebody else's work and claiming it as your own. Uh, I believe that one's pretty a pretty obvious example of a copyright infringement. Um, may not be that simple, but you know I think everybody kind of gets that you don't take somebody else's work and represent it as your own. Um, if you observe somebody else's work and then implement it yourself, and you wind up with uh, uh, some 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 results that are substantially similar to the original, you may have actually infringed on the copyright. Uh, this is where we start getting into the gray area, and then I really start to feel uncomfortable giving any actual advice. What constitutes substantially similar varies jur jurisdiction by jurisdiction and case by case. Uh, many organizations go to great lengths to ensure that their own developers don't observe work to mitigate against infringement claims. Um, so, you know, I've worked for uh, a number of organizations over the years and very often our, the, the training, um, uh, includes as sort of as a software developer includes making sure you're careful about what you look at, um, before you actually write anything. Again, um, the substantially similar is one of those things that, uh, is hard to, hard to, um, quantify, uh, so, so even again, even if you look at somebody else's stuff and implement it yourself, that may not be, uh, may not prevent you or pr protect you from copyright infringement. Um, fair use is another gray area that varies by jur jurisdiction. Uh, parody is a form of fair use. Uh, a musician sampling segments of uh, somebody else's song may be fair use. Criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research are all areas of fair use. Showing somebody's code in your in your uh, paper and talking about it um, that may be that may constitute fair use. Again, this is one of those things where I start using really hedgy language, and uh, I'm not sure uh, this would be something that you should likely you know if you're writing a paper run it by the university's uh, council to make sure that you're not violating anybody's license. The term de minimis um, it originate, originates from Latin and roughly translates to the law does not concern itself with trifling matters. De minimis might apply, uh, for example, when a contribution fixes a spelling mistake. Boilerplate or rote uh, content may also fall into this category. Again, this is gray area. In general, don't copy somebody else's work and claim it as your own. So this leads us to licensing. Just quick check, no hands. Okay, either I've lulled you to sleep or there are no questions. Excellent. So if copyright is about ownership uh, and all rights are retained by the copyright holder by default, what do you do when you actually want to share your work? By default, um, no, no rights, uh, no copyright, uh, sorry, copyright grants no rights to anybody but themselves. I have a question from Dimitri. Yes, hello. This, thanks very much. It's a very comprehensive uh, presentation. I have one question. Uh, I'm a bit baffled. Um, so let's say that I produce a piece of code that is open source. It has a, an open source license. And then someone else uh, decides that this idea is brilliant and they want to create a product that will be marketed, uh, commercialized. And they take this code, they may add up some further functionalities. 
as I understand it, they're allowed to sell this product. Is that correct? And if it's so, what what protection does the copyright provide to the to the to the owner, to the creator of the copyright? Does it make so, sense? So your question is an excellent lead into licensing. Oh, perfect. I'm glad. Um, so yeah, so copyright. If when you create something, you own it. You have all of the rights. Nobody else has any rights. That's the the you know the very simple form of it. If you actually want people to take your content and use it in some other way, that's what we do. That's what licensing for. So, so by default, the copyright holder owns all the rights. Licenses are how we extend rights to others. There are a wide variety of licenses, but they generally fall into three different categories. And I've got them listed here. Um, two, two broad categories and then two very specific ones. Uh, permissive, weak copyleft, and strong copyleft. And then, of course, there are proprietary licenses. And then, I guess there's this other category of licenses uh, that I mentioned earlier that kind of look open sourcey, but really aren't. Um, but I'm going to try and focus mostly, or I'm going to focus exclusively on, on open source licenses. If you have uh, questions about other licenses, we can play with that a little bit uh, later. Um, this table is very over, oversimplified. Um, if you were to go to uh, choosealicense.com, uh, which is a fairly, uh, which is a, a resource that helps you um, decide what license you might want to use based on what you want to do. They have 13 different uh, categories of grants, conditions, and limitations. Uh, so again, like I said, this table is very oversimplified. But um, if we want people to be able to use our software commercially, they want to modify it and distribute it and sub-license it, all of those things, um, any of these licenses will probably be fine. We'll help you out. Um, Limiting uh, I, I, commercial is in that list. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you were to limit commercial, right, limit against people using things commercially, then your license would no longer be, the license would not be open source. And I'm not talking, I mean, I, we're not covering that today. Um, generally, all of the licenses have a requirement that you must give attribution, include an existing copyright uh, and license header. Um, and all that other information along with uh, with your content. So, you know, you can't, under most licenses, you can't uh, take somebody else's content, remove their header, replace it with your own. Um, which, again, these are all seem, I think, fairly reasonable. Uh, hopefully you all agree. Um, you cannot, so cannot hold uh, the author liable or use their trademarks. Um, again, these tend to be included in all of the licenses. Right, you can't. Uh, you, know, you can use this content, but the, if some, something bad happens, you can't sue the author. Um, so all of these licenses have that. It's when we get to the bottom that we start seeing the differences. Um, with a permissive license, you you basically grab, got a lot of freedom to do all sorts of things. Uh, there's generally no requirement to include source code when you distribute content with a permissive license. You don't. With weak copyleft and strong copyleft, you're required to um, include the source code with uh, with your distribution, again, generally. Um, the last one's kind of the one where uh, we really kind of make the distinction. Do you have to license your code under the same license? So if you're using content under a particular license in a particular way, you may have, depending on the license, an obligation to distribute your content under the same license. Now, um, most of the open source licenses have um, some sort of a, a disclaimer of liability in uh, big block letters. Uh, in many jurisdictions, use of uppercase letters uh, and a disclaimer of liability is a legal requirement to ensure that the disclaimer is prominent and conspicuous. Um, it's done in this way to draw the attention of the reader as if to say, if you read nothing else, uh, read this. Uh, a more cynical take is that the requirement to be prominent and conspicuous is a response to past use of small print to trick consumers. Um, so again, you'll see this big block of uppercase text in most licenses. Um, that's again, that's 
that's done on inten entirely intentionally. Um, so again, like I said, this table is oversimplified, but this kind of highlights uh, the differences uh, of, across them. And I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each of these. Um, permissive licenses uh, allow anyone to do almost anything with the code, including using it in a closed source project with the main requirement being that of attribution, right? You can use it, but make sure you remember, you know, remember who gave you this. Um, some permissive licenses also require anyone who distributes the code to mention where they got it from. Uh, unlike copyleft licenses, permissive licenses do not force derivative works to be open source and copyleft. Um, this means that permissive licenses can be used uh, in proprietary derivative works, and there are minimal obligations or restrictions on how the open source components can be used, modified, and distributed. So the basic idea of copyleft, um, I guess the term copyleft. So we have this co concept of copyright. So copyright is... Um, I own this, this is mine, I have all the rights. Copyleft is intended to be the opposite of that. The idea of copyleft is here are the rights that I'm giving you, here are the obligations that I would like you to, uh, to meet, um, right? So again, so copyright is about hold, uh, keeping everything, copyleft is about granting access. Um, the uh, copyleft is based on, on the underlying principle that anyone can benefit freely from the previous work of others, but that modifications to that work should benefit everyone else as well, and thus must be released under similar terms. So when you modify content under a copyright license, sorry, pardon me, under a copyleft license, you are required to distribute those modifications under the same license terms. Um, you will often hear the term, uh, the strong copyleft, you'll often hear them referred to as being viral. Uh, licenses that are strong copyleft tend to define derivative, derivative very, um, uh, very broadly, including content that is linked or um, you know, subclasses of, of uh, or, and things like that. The basic idea behind strong copyleft is noble. All software needs to be free. Um, strong copyleft uh, sometimes. Uh, this is a personal observation. Um, can sometimes be used to limit freedom. Uh, in many cases, and this, this is unfortunately a bit ironic, in many cases, you actually lose the freedom to create proprietary products based on uh, a strong copyleft license. Uh, it's not uncommon, for example, for vendors to release software under a strong copyleft license, which makes it useful when used by an open source project, but an adopter who wants to create a proprietary, uh, bit of proprietary software based on the content inherits a requirement to distribute their product under the same license terms, uh, which will drive some uh, vendors to seek out an alternative non-open source license, right? So, so in some cases, copy left, strong copy left can be used to kind of set up a marketplace to, to sell an alternative. Um, anyway, I, that's all I want to say about that. Um, weak copy left, the Eclipse uh, public license is an example of weak copyleft. Uh, the definition of uh, derivative in, in our license is that if you modify the Eclipse, uh, uh, the content under the EPL, then those modifications need to be made available. But your products based on the EPL do not need to be similarly licensed, right? So that's the, the main difference between strong copyleft and a weak copyleft is strong. Weak copyleft says, make sure you share what you what you've changed, strong copy left is everybody should also be the same license. Um, some examples, um, permissive licenses, Apache, BSD, MIT, uh, weak copy left, EPL, the Mozilla public license, um, the uh, lesser GNU public license. Uh, you may have also heard of the LGPL referred to as the library uh, G G GNU uh, public license. Uh, they've uh, it's lesser these days. Um, strong copy left, the more common, the most common examples of these are the GPL and the AGPL. Whether or not a license is strong copy left or weak copy left very often comes down to how the licenses uh, define derivative work. Uh, direct modification of the source code 
of a copy left license is considered a derivative work. The EPL is a weak copy left license. If you take content that's distributed under the EPL, modify it, and then distribute it, you'd be required to distribute your modifications under the EPL. Creating a new plugin for the Eclipse platform or an extension for Eclipse Thea, which are both licensed under the EPL, is not considered a derivative work. Likewise, linking to Eclipse Collections and using the classes in that library in your own code is not considered a derivative work under the EPL. The GPL is a strong copy life, uh, copyleft license, which regards derivative works more, far more broadly. For example, subclassing GPL Java class or implementing a GPL interface is considered creating a derivative work. Your, uh, the GPL considers linking object files or uh, connecting to a shared object file or a DLL as a derivative work. If your code directly accesses a node module, uh, distributed under the GPL, it is most likely considered a derivative work and subject to the terms of that license. Uh, note that the GPL does not distinguish between static and dynamic linking. In practical terms, if a project is linked to a GPL licensed library, whether statically or dynamically, the terms and conditions of the GPL cover the entire combination. This means that the program itself must be licensed under the GPL and the source code must be made available in accordance with the GPL's requirements. Uh, the GPL does not consider con linking to con or connecting to contact, uh, content via a socket or a web services call or a command line interface uh, to be a derivative work. Um, the Eclipse CDT does this, for example. The Eclipse CDT is licensed under EPL but it makes use of GDB, which is under the GPL. Um, it does that through a CLI interface, um, thereby avoiding the, the, uh, the, the, link, uh, the linking there. Um, the AGPL covers some of these gaps. Specifically, the AGPL, which is the Afero uh, GNU public license, uh, includes access via web services as derivative. So it's pretty much the case that when you have a GPL content in your stack, the whole thing is subject to the terms of that license. Uh, the GPL 3.0 has a specific carve out uh, for a GPL, but uh, again, that's something I'm not prepared to, uh, to descend into. Um, the impact of all of these licenses very often depends on exactly what you're doing. And, case by case. So it's very difficult to give broad um, uh, broad advice. We have an intellectual property uh, team here that spends an awful lot of time thinking about this kind of stuff for you. So when uh, when we have licensing challenges like that, uh, engage with the, certainly Eclipse project committers should engage with the, uh, the IP team for assistance and uh, we'll work with the research folks to do what we can as well. Um, licenses can be modified using exceptions. Uh, the class path exception applies to the GPL version 2.0. It permits independent software modules to link with the content without being subject to the terms of the license as they'd normally be. Uh, this is a means by which it is possible, for example, to use Java modules under a variety of licenses on the OpenJDK runtime. The OpenJDK is GPL with actually a couple of different exceptions, uh, one of them being class path, right? So the, the idea is the exception says anything on the Java class path uh, isn't uh, subject to these terms. Um, just as an aside, uh, a couple of different licenses, the WTFPL um, was created as satire. Um, it's relatively uncommon, but we do actually see it uh, in, in our reviews here. Um, it is not OSI approved, uh, but not for the reasons you might think. Uh, vulgarity, uh, if I've commented out the vulgar word, um, vulgarity is not nice, but it's actually not a problem. There's no rule uh, in the open source definition that says you can't use the F word. Um, some organizations uh, do prohibit the use of this language, citing that its terms are vague. Um, the uh, OSI rejected it. Uh, well, now, the reason was that it uh, didn't actually add anything. Um, and they considered it, I believe, to be a vanity license. I, I can't remember the exact terms. Um, 
We actually do allow the use of uh, the WTFPL uh, uh, license uh, in Eclipse projects. Um, we consider it to be a permissive license. Um, conveniently, the uh, WTFPL uh, logo is also distributed under that license. So I'm just doing whatever the heck I want with it. I was thinking about twisting it and skewing it because apparently I can do whatever I want. Um, the uh, JSON license, again, now they're just, just more for fun. Uh, some of the things that we have to deal with. Uh, to the best of my uh, knowledge, the JSON license was uh, created as a subversive act. Uh, the the uh, creator uh, of this license uh, thinks that licenses are silly. Uh, the license is not OSI approved uh, on the basis that it fails the sixth requirement of the open source definition that no uh, there be no discrimination against fields of endeavor. Uh, that is, uh, preventing the software's use for evil is considered a field of use restriction, which I find super hilarious. Um, it's equally entertaining uh, to, for me, uh, at least, that good and evil are considered legally ambiguous. Uh, many organizations prohibit its use, including the Eclipse and uh, Apache Foundations. We actually do see this one pretty often. Um, this one here, uh, I'll uh, go quickly through. Um, the license sys, uh, Linux syscall, uh, Linux itself is, is, is under, distributed under the GPL. Um, which might make you think, hey, if I run things on Linux, doesn't that make the things I'm running have to be GPL? And the answer is no, there's this exception. Basically, use, using Linux as an operating system does not constitute uh, a derivative work as defined by the, the license. Um, if you are creating demo template and configuration content, uh, regardless of what license you choose for your, your main content, it's generally a good idea to use a very a permissive license for, for this kind of content, because this is the kind of content you actually want people to copy. Uh, you actually want people to make derivative works of this content and, uh, and uh, you know, basically build their own solutions. Um, I this I'm not I'm not sure. this last recommendation don't include headers. One of the problems with including headers is as soon as you include headers, most most permissive licenses require that you retain the retain the headers. Um, so if you're generating content for um, like boilerplate content or or you know content uh, uh, you know framework for something that you expect people to grab and copy and turn into their own thing, um, don't you don't necessarily don't necessarily include headers on those. Um, expressing the license, uh, our current policy is that all source content must have a file header and must have a file header that expresses the copyright and the license, at least when possible. Uh, so JSON files, for example, don't have any notion of comments. So license header makes no sense uh, in a technical matter there. It's common to describe uh, license text textually. Uh, natural language can unfortunately, though, be imprecise. Uh, this statement, if you read it, there's an or statement that I've tried to highlight. Uh, I guess you can see it. Um, in English, anyway, if you were to change that or to an and, it doesn't really change the meaning of the statement uh, necessarily, right? It, could, it can be interpreted in different ways, and that's a problem. Um, we've adopted at the Eclipse Foundation, we've adopted the use of SPDX to uh, specify our licenses. So in this case, that bottom line that I have uh, highlighted, um, SPDX has these uh, well-defined identifiers of, of, of many, many licenses, including some, you know, many op non-open source licenses. But uh, so SPDX has a very, very specific code that they use to refer to the EPL 2.0 and a very specific code that they refer to uh, used to refer to the Apache 2.0 license. And they have a syntax that describes very precisely how the licenses are combined. So when I see an SPDX license identifier that says EPL 2.0 or, or Apache uh, 2.0, this means that as a consumer, I can pick whichever of those two licenses I want and consume the content under those terms. Um, so again, from a from a uh, just for, from a pre precision point of view, this is handy. Um, the format of this SPDX dash license dash identifier colon um, very specific. This is very machine readable. Uh, makes it very easy to go through content and identify uh, the licenses. I have a um, a picture or the logo for the reuse 
Um, uh, reuse project reuse allows us to uh, specify licenses for all content, including content that uh, doesn't lend itself well uh, to commenting. So you can add um, copyright and license information to your project for binary files, image files, JSON files, other you know, problematic file formats. Sometimes you have content that changes regularly and keeping the, the header on that uh, up to date is is painful. Uh, reuse has an answer uh, for that, and we strongly encourage our projects to do that. Um, it's reuse dot software. Um, it's a project of the uh, Free Software Foundation Europe. Um, development process um, for freedoms uh, and open source definition describe how software is distributed. It doesn't really talk about how. Um, software is developed. I'm, I'm going to, uh, we, we at the Eclipse Foundation have the Eclipse Foundation development process, which defines an open, transparent, and meritocratic process for developing software. Um, we think this is, uh, we think that we believe this is valuable, and apparently so do a lot of other people. Um, one of the things it does uh, that we do manage is contributions, and uh, this is important. I'm going to skip through this slide because I realize I'm running short of time. Um, we at the Eclipse Foundation employ uh, symmetrical inbound and outbound licensing. Uh, this basically means that when somebody comes to your project and makes a contribution of content, they are doing so under the terms of the project license. The project is accepting it under those terms, and then we distribute it out to the community. The Eclipse Foundation redistributes it under those same license terms. We don't change the terms. Now, one of the um, impacts of this is the people who show up and give you their contributions continue to own them. So we wind up in a situation where the content of the project is owned by all of the contributors. Everybody, lots of, all the contributors own various pieces of it. The whole then is owned by the group and any, you know, when you start talking about things like managing, changing the license, you need to have all of the copyright holders agree to that. Um, asymmetrical inbound and outbound licenses is just what the, the term asymmetrical means. Uh, the license in may be different than the license out. And as part of that, uh, you uh, generally with asymmetrical inbound and outbound licensing, you assign equivalent to ownership uh, privileges uh, to the, um, to the, uh, um, uh, to the, to the, the, the steward to, to, in this case, I guess, to whoever is going to own the, or to hold the code. Um, in, in giving those equivalent to ownership privileges, then you, you wind up basically giving away your ability to argue against a, a license change. Um, this may seem like uh, that's a good thing, right? Having one person or one organization, one entity own uh, all of the content gives you uh, the ability to move fairly quickly and, and make a, you know important decisions. Um, but it also allows, you know, results in things like we've, we're starting to see this, uh, we've seen this a few times recently where uh, previously open source solutions have been just unilaterally changed. Uh, the, ter the terms of this just been changed by, by one entity because that one entity has all of the rights. Uh, again, we consider the um, messiness of asymmetrical, sorry, pardon me, of symmetrical inbound and outbound licenses. We consider that to be a feature, not a bug. Um, sorry, I'm running really short of time, so I'm going to try and power through. We use a developer's certificate of origin. This is basically an assertion that um, the content that we we ask our contributors to 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 to, uh, to basically sign the Eclipse contributor agreement, which includes this, as do our contributor committer agreements. The developer certificate of origin is basically an assertion that. Either you've authored everything and have all the rights, or you otherwise know that you have that the things are the content that you're contributing is licensed in such a way that you can contribute it to the project under the project's licensing terms. It also uh, includes a, a statement that you understand that your in, your your personal information, your name and email address on your contributions, for example, on your commits, will be part of the public record. It's all. Uh, when asymmetrical inbound and outbound licenses are used, it's very common to see a CLA that has uh, some statement in it that says that you are transferring uh, certain rights. Uh, I'm showing an example here of an older version of the MySQL uh, contribution uh, contributor license agreement. 
Um, again, a couple of years ago, MongoDB uh, used these rights to change its license. Uh, Elasticsearch uh, did something similar in 2021. Um, in these cases and, and in others, the contributors could do nothing, uh, but uh, it turns out one of the things they could do is just fork everything and uh, start over again. So I realize that I've done very poor time management and it's now the bottom of the hour. Uh, do I have a few more minutes or do I need to wrap up right now? I think you can have more minutes so you can go. Okay, good. So if you have to drop off, I, I apologize for taking so long. Uh, the, the recording will be available. Um, just quick talk about uh, patents and trademarks. Uh, we talked about content reading on patents. That's just the, the terminology uh, that I've observed. The, uh, the idea is if you, um, if you write, if you write software that uh, has uh, that implements some patent, we would say that it reads on that patent. Uh, many open source licenses make patent grants explicit. Uh, it generally takes this form. When you as a developer make a contribution to an open source project, you make an implicit grant of any patents that you represent with that contribution. So if, for example, uh, your organization, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you represent your organization on an open source project, you are implicating your organization's patent portfolio with your contribution. Um, only the patents that read on the content uh, you actually provide are committed, and uh, you don't need to explicitly list the uh, the patents. This is just all implicit. Um, scenario: the over highly over oversimplified scenario that we're trying to avoid uh, when we see these patent grants and licenses is a hypothetical bad actor making a contribution to an open source project uh, that is accepted and becomes part of the project content. Um, several companies then go and grab that content and they put that into their production environments. And then the bad actor goes about, goes around and sues the, uh, the various adopters for patent infringement. Um, again, oversimplified. I am not a lawyer. Um, if you need uh, legal advice, and I certainly would recommend this, um, check with your own counsel. Um, generally when people are signing our agreements, uh, there's some requirement within your organization to make sure that, uh, Somebody reviews them so that they understand what uh, what you're getting into. Certainly, with regard to this, um, software licenses do not typically convey any trademark rights. Uh, the license uh, describes how you can use the software, but does not grant you any rights to use the project name. You cannot, for example, use somebody else's trademark in your own products. Uh, Eclipse open source project names are trademarks of the Eclipse Foundation. You cannot use them in your own products. They are based on, you know, that are based on this content. Uh, trademark usage is typically managed via trademark usage guidelines. Uh, theoretically, access to trademarks can be licensed, though we don't tend to see this uh, in open source. Um, it's never proper to just write Java. It really should uh, denote it as Java with the TM. Um, the uh, R in a circle and the TM. Um, to your trademark improves your ability to protect trademarks in the United States and, and in some other jurisdictions. Uh, these demarcations are not generally meaningful uh, in the EU. Um, uh, some jurisdictions have this notion of common law. Uh, again, this is something that the EU doesn't make any sense. When we talk to Europeans about it, they have no idea what we mean. Um, common law in, in many jurisdictions, in Canada and the United States, and there's, there's a few others. Um, you could claim trademark without formally registering the mark. Common law claims are generally weaker than registered trademarks. Um, so we actually have a group here that takes uh, uh, that, that 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 you know manages trademarks on on behalf of the Eclipse Foundation and and their, the community uh, around it. Um, Trademark uh, is really just about avoiding or mostly about avoiding confusion. I have an example here. Uh, somebody were to make a project called the MicroProfile Force 10 server uh, to a casual um, a casual person or an average person, a person of average intelligence, there would be some confusion about who owns the MicroProfile name. Um, generally accepted, most trademark usage guidelines have the you can turn it around. So force 10 server for micro profile uh, would be a valid use and it's suggestive to a person of average intelligence that micro profile is something separate from and different from force 10 server. 
Um, a lot of trademark, again, trademark uh, management is about avoiding confusion. And as a trademark holder, we have a responsibility to, uh, to enforce this. Otherwise, we weaken our hold on the trademarks. This is why you'll see large companies go after people. Uh, they go after, you know, it's, it's, it seems ridiculous that they're going after people for using their marks. If they don't, then they run the risk of losing management of their and control of their mark. Talk briefly about artificial intelligence. Uh, recall our uh, definition of intellectual property. Uh, it very specifically said intangible assets created through human intellect. The uh, general legal consensus is content generated by an, AP, an AI um, cannot be owned or copyrighted. Uh, there is a, um, oh, sorry, uh, your modifications to AI generated content, however, is your copyright, uh, probably. Um, we call it curation as a copyrightable act. When you modify AI generated content, your modifications are yours. Uh, that does not automatically make the AI content copyrightable or copyrighted. Um, so there's a bit of gray area here and I'm offering very little advice at this point. Um, GTP, sorry, GPT technology doesn't copy content, rather it forms content based on connections that it learns uh, from its training data. Uh, in some sense, uh, the GPT can be said to have access. Uh, remember, that was one of the conditions um, for potential copyright infringement. For, uh, 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 copyright infringement. When uh, what it does generate, if, if when it, what it does, does generate is substantially similar to content from the training data, there is some risk of copyright infringement. Um, how do we access the risk? I, I, I don't know. Uh, how do these risks compare between GPT generation and a human just coincidentally writing thing, like uh, something? Again, I, I just, I don't know. Our best advice is to use GPT technology that is able to cite its references or similar tools that allow you to compare generated content against training data and that you use those references to make a judgment regarding whether or not the generated content is substantially similar or that it might be considered boilerplate or rote, right? If this is just how you do something, um, that might fall into, we don't care, uh, the, the de minimis uh, thing I talked about earlier. Um, I won't talk about it now, but if you haven't already read about the mon monkey selfie copyright uh, thing, I recommend it. Uh, great picture. Monkey is also not a lawyer. So my wrap up, uh, just some notices. Um, some of the por some portions of this were generated with some assistance uh, from u.com um, and uh, which cites its references uh, and i am not a lawyer with that i'm done again i'm sorry that i went over hopefully uh, those of you that stuck around this was valuable um, i hope something i said today was useful and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend thank question you, from thank Philippe. you so much yes we have a question from philip and joanne so please, Philip, can you yes, see sorry. your question? Uh, yeah, I was looking for the, the unmute button. Uh, yes, my question is, is pretty uh, simple. It's about uh, dual license. Uh, when when would you recommend to use a dual license and how dual license works? So when do I recommend? Um, I can't answer that ca ca uh, question generally. Um, there's all sorts of examples. I'd have to understand based on a, a, an example. I might be able to give you some advice, but um, I I don't I I don't know. Right? And if you if you want to have so one of the so one of the examples that we have is um, you, you, the uh, Eclipse uh, the, the Jakarta projects are all dual licensed under the EPL and the GPL with class path exception. So they're dual licensed under both of those. Um, if you, uh, you and you can choose to 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 consume that content under either of those licenses, um, they're they're those two. Uh, yeah, again, so why you would do that uh, gets varies uh, by you know by by case. Um, how do you do that? Um, is you declare it. Um, that should be done at the the done. The copyright holder is the one who the copyright holders are the ones who would decide about licensing. Um, so you know you can't just. Add add another license to somebody else's content. Uh, you can add it to your own. But does it mean that you specify in the release note the, your documentation that you are using this component under this uh, specific license? Uh, it's uh, I just so to... 
So copyright header. So copyright header in your files should indicate the license. Though if you're doing dual license, that would be that or syntax that I I um, shown I showed it with the with the yeah. SPDX code. Um, the general practice is to have a license file in the root of your repository. Uh, sometimes that file is called copying. Uh, there's various a uh, couple of different conventions. Um, the license file should explain the licensing. Uh, it's also common for projects to include that information in their readme file. Thank you. Um, a notices file is another place where you might see an expression of the license. Uh, under reuse.software, uh, there would be a folder called licenses in your, the root of your repository, which would include uh, e individual files with the text of, of each license. Um, but then it would still, you know, how you combine those licenses, you would have to express. Uh, again, in the headers, um, tools today, like scan code, know how to figure all that kind of stuff out, which is pretty handy. Uh, Giovanni has a question. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, well, we are in an environment here of research, European research projects, right? So let's assume a relatively modern um, collaborative project with uh, uh, a modern DevOps environment. It's clear from what you said already that there is a lot of practical links between the DevOps uh, setup and the legal thing. No, you said you use git blame, you use git log, that's fair enough. Uh, enter AI. We have a lot of projects in this area that uh, your colleagues uh, are, are managing in the CSA that will do you know, some, uh, some training or anyway, some AI model. So the AI model probably philosophically is data, but it determines how the system behaves, so it works like the source code. So is, the, is there some uh, indication on how they should be licensed? Should we use uh, source code licenses like, like the, the one that you explained, or it's more about data, co creative commons kind of thing? Wow, that's a good question. Um, yeah, uh, so, okay, so we have, uh, if we have, um... You have, I a think model, you, may... you have a model that is based on training data, and that training data yes. is under a variety of licenses. Yeah, okay, but let, let, let's assume that the training data is self-collected. So these people work together three years in a research project. They have a consortium agreement that says the right, and they decide to go as open source as possible, and all their code is open source. But then there is a, a trained neural network, and there is the file with the numbers of the neural network. What is that? Is it, because for me, it, it's, it's source code because it, it determines the effectiveness and the behavior of a system, right? But is it from a legal point of view? So I would like to license this stuff, let's say, with open source licenses, if possible. But I'm not sure because I guess it's a very gray area as well. So so uh, there, there's, a, I am not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I So the short version is I actually... I have some thoughts, but I, I don't feel I can share it. I don't think feel that fumbling around trying to figure this out on the on this in this context is actually going to work. Could you share that um, that that question with uh, with me? Uh, just you can send it to via email to uh, yeah yeah. yeah. I will yeah, do it through Rosaria we'll, and, uh, we'll, we'll and, it and Philip. Yeah, because we have some, uh, we are point of contact in this project from this research project, so we could give them some guidelines with all the disclaimers that you mentioned. Eh? Yeah. But I, I, we could also make ask them, what are you doing? Come back with 20, 30 <laughs> you know, opinions how they want to license their trained data, sorry, AI models. Because of course, then there is MLOps, no? so you would also like to automate this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how, how they are doing, but nominally most of our projects, I think, right? They are, so they have some part, some AI models that they say that they want to use. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and thanks a lot. Course, yeah, so of course the answer, you know, very much depends on what you actually want to do. Like, what do you want people to be able to do with that data? And um, and it's also like you know you 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 yeah, I get I get how you think it's you you perceive it as code, but we'd have to kind of have some some um think have some uh, if others think about it as data then then that kind of may I agree. You no, it's it's more it's more an ethical stance. Yeah. Uh, oh, I wish it were code. It's more like that. I'm not sure that it is rationally, but it seems more right that it is licensed because it's the product of the research work of this group, right? So or also an individual, it's the same. I think this is a very tricky bit uh, at the moment, yeah. but yeah, I so don't know. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you send me, you can describe the problem. Yeah, yeah uh, I will. See, see how much we can help. 
Yep. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, all the other also. Mm, thank you so much, Wayne. Uh, I think that we can uh, we can close this webinar. Uh, thanking again all the participants and uh, Wayne, um, our guests. Uh, 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 there is there is one question from uh, Sebastian Barilero that we haven't addressed. Uh, yes, because I saw that. Uh, um, if the objective generated by an AI, a piece of software, does not have a copyright, why the object generated by a compiler, another piece of software, have or not have copyright on the binary? I think that the same answer will apply, but please. So that's Wayne. an interesting, yeah, interesting, interesting gotcha. Um, so basically with the compiler, you are feeding content to the compiler and it is generating content out. Um, the, the, it, you're, it's not, uh, it, it's, it's generating based on content that you're providing. The license is very, well, it's your content. Uh, the license is what it is on that content and put it through. Um, it's the compiler is, is basically translating something that you've done. Um, it, it's a different scenario than, than a, a GPT generating novel new content based on training data. Okay. I think that we. Yeah, that's the sort of the short version. Um, I, I think we can say if you if you want a longer conversation again, emo at eclipse.org, and I'll I'll see what I can do to help you. <laughs>